So, Gary, would you start by telling us a bit about your organization? Sure. We founded Promundo in 99 in Brazil to look particularly at young men and adult men in favelas in Rio with a question around how do we, I think the, the last panel talked a lot about the how heterogeneous men are, and particularly looking at men who questioned lots of forms of violence that exist in, in favelas in Rio de Janeiro, but really intrigued by the question of not why is there so much violence and why are masculinities constructed to be so violent, but why is there so much resistance to it as well, and how could we play into the resistance? Mostly looking at young men and their views around buying into a version of manhood based on domination of others, often around violence, sometimes quite accepting of use of violence against women, very accepting that care work was women's work. And then over the years, in, in multiple of those themes, we've worked on how can we build up those voices of resistance, and how can we use those voices to really design campaigns, activism, community-based <coughs> interventions, and try to scale those up in the government. So Promundo's existed since 99. We opened an office in Washington, D.C. two years ago to coordinate some of the work outside of Brazil. And we also have a small office in Rwanda doing some work with local organizations there around engaging men in gender equality and violence prevention. Okay, good. Well, can we probe a little bit on your work that you've been doing on, on care mm -hmm. in particular? Because you said that at a recent UN expert group meeting on gender equality, the post-NDGs discussion, that you said that one of the global goals should be men and boys doing 50% of, of the world's unpaid care work. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. Um, you know, as we look at what's going to be in the next round of development goals in terms of gender equality, trying to, to trouble that a bit, to, to push the edge a bit and say, look, how do we expect there's been a huge amount of investment and there needs to be a lot around women's economic empowerment and equality in terms of income in the workplace. We know the numbers of just the vast percentage increase in women's participation in paid work in recent years. It's now 40% of the paid workforce that women are half of the world's global food producers. But we still seem stuck on proposing, therefore, how do we do a greater share of what happens in terms of the care of others. Um, frequently, that question rings as, so therefore, we're simply going to do kind of the age-old time use studies that measure how many hours are spent a day. And that's really not what I meant by the 50%. <laughs> um, but I think it is important to say, how do we expect that we achieve this equality in income and in all kinds of spaces where we want women and men to, to achieve that equality if we don't also fundamentally look at who does the care work. And again, that's not counting how many times did I change nappies today compared to how many times my partner well, changed nappies today. That is quite important. That is quite important. Um, <laughs> but looking at it as a fundamental, how do we divide our lives up in terms of who, how, how we take into account our existence of most, of many of us anyway, as both caregivers as well as providers. And that, in, that is increasingly no longer just a male thing, that is both all of us doing that. So I think, how do we structure lives? How do we structure social service programs? How do we understand our importance as human beings going beyond simply being providers? So tell us a little bit though about why, why, why do you think care is so important? Um, specifically unpaid care work, not, not, not you know, all kinds of care, yeah. but specifically the unpaid care work that goes yeah. on in hand. What, what do you mean by that in fact? I mean, I think, you know, if we, reading, you know, our first readings of Connell back in the mid-90s and early 90s about what constructs this huge difference between what we're calling hegemonic masculinities and femininities. So much of it is about how we divide this work, the unpaid versus the paid work worlds. So I think whether we look at how boys and their identities are constructed based on the outward achievement orientation, the I must be a provider or nothing else, as your research is finding as well, I mean, so much of this frames not only how we become as individuals, but also how we construct the work world, the home world, the education world, based on that very fundamental division of women do care work, not only for children, but also for the elderly and also as professions, and men do the, the important stuff outside the home in a way. So I think it, it's not only about a justice issue of women having the full right to income, to a space in the outside world, but also the kind of pieces of humanity that men lose by not being connected to the daily care of others. Um, so I think that as a part of, to understand how much that shapes who we are as men, um, and, and from boy, boyhood onward to call it that, I think is also revolutionary and missing from a lot of our discussions around this. It is, it is revolutionary though, this pieces of humanity argument that you're yeah. trying to make. I think that is the, that would be a real challenge for you given that so much of unpaid care work is just dirty and dull yeah. and 
sometimes can be quite demeaning yeah. for the caregiver. Yeah. How, how can you, you know, what kinds of arguments are you able to construct that have worked so yeah. far with men and boys for that matter? I mean, part is trying to, and I think Phil said this quite eloquently as well, of tapping into what's speaking to, to men's souls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing we're doing in the Sonke and, and Promundo launched about two years ago, a global, we're calling it a campaign, it's, that's kind of a vaguely used word, but 25 countries now part of this initiative that we're calling Men Care. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to deliberately be very affirmative and using lots of images of men doing care work in multiple forms. Much of it around men and their own biological children, but going much beyond that. And trying to, and capturing stories and images, both in research and in the films that are online, and in the posters and such that we're using of men doing diverse forms of care work. Most men look at those images and see the stories and say, that resonates with something that I've either done and felt positive about, or it resonates with something that I didn't do and I'm feeling that I'm kind of missing it in my in my experiences. So we're very deliberately using those positive messages and I think men are looking at those in different ways than kind of our classic billboards that violence is harmful and it causes all kinds of, it's speaking to men to say we believe that you can step up and do this. And that most men who have tried it find it to be, you know, kind of a resonating experience. What, but what, why would this be different then? Why would your experience with those sorts of images and messages be more successful do you think? Well, we, you know, kind of, we, many of us get goosebumps of looking at a picture of, you know, a man cuddling a small child. I mean, there is, there's something quite, <laughs> you know, appealing in the sense of um, this, is, this is something that brings deep meaning to men's and women's lives, that, that close connection with others. Um, so I do think it, it speaks up to a way of, let me, let me start it from the other way around. Um, our women's economic empowerment work has often started off with an assumption that men won't provide much of their income to the household. If you have an income generation program or a conditional cash transfer program, money in the hands of women is more likely to go into the household. While that may be true in household surveys, we then use that data to drive policy, which in fact creates its own realities. We continue to tell, tell men that we don't believe you're going to contribute in meaningful ways to the household, and therefore we're, we're investing in women's income mostly. Again, there's certainly an affirmative action and equality that needs to be affirmed. But the message that's clear to lots of men is you don't really expect me to do these things that we consider good, as opposed to putting out there a set of images and beliefs that we think you already do some of this and you can do more of it, um, I think resonates in far more interesting ways than kind of our, our equality from the assumption that you're not doing it from kind of a deficit perspective, to call it that. Um, and you can, you know, I don't want to go too far on the, on the sort of biological stuff as well, but just as we know that women's bodies during this, some really interesting stuff that BBC put out um, in a couple of the studies on what happens physically and hormonally to men's bodies in close contact with the caregiving of others. Again, not to make too much of the biology of it, but to acknowledge that bodies and the, the bodily experiences of caring for others also bring some pretty clear health benefits um, of looking both at self-care that comes from doing the care of others. Mm -hmm. So I think, I don't think we should shy away from saying there is some stuff that if we do this is good for men, mm -hmm. and it's okay to say that mm -hmm. if we can step out of that zero-sum trap. I think that there is a risk here, which is that I think uh, in Northern Europe where <coughs> men have got more involved in, in aspects of care work yeah. in, the, in the past generation or so, yeah. it has been mainly with childcare to some extent cooking, whereas it's still women cleaning the toilets and yeah. doing the dull stuff and looking yeah. after the older people. You haven't mentioned much about elderly care. No. Have you heard, done much work on that? No, I think it's a fascinating That's not one. not quite so cuddly. No. <laughs> Very true. That question, there was a, I was just in a debate in Amsterdam, which now has a new policy where they're going to deinstitutionalize a lot of the elder care. And lots of folks were talking about, what am I going to do with, yeah. with gramps, right? Yeah. I mean, what am I going to do with the grandparents? Um, a lot of fear of a society built on the fact that, you know, when you're too young, we put you in places, and when you're older, we put you in places. If you're not productive age, we really don't have much room for you, except for, you know, the end of the day or on a Sunday afternoon when we go for lunch. I mean, I think there's an interesting thing of driving societies toward that. Some of the individuals I talked to in the Netherlands saying, this is quite interesting. I mean, it makes us think about what kind of humane treatment do we have in terms of the elderly in our society? Why are we doing all this kind of generational separation into the institutions that we create? Interestingly, at the same debate, there was a colleague from Suriname who said, I would never even think of putting my, his father had passed away, but his mother was living at home. And so someone asked him, well, okay, yeah, the, the, you know, the caring for the babies, 
could be sexy, but what about you know caring for your grandmother? And he said, look, or my, for your mother? And he said, I think my wife finds me sexier because I, you know, in, in my cultural setting, not to be respectful toward and not to provide that care simply wouldn't make me a very interesting man. But that's one very isolated example. But I do think, you know, how do we value that in the workplace? How do we, how do we kind of hold up examples of women and men who do that kind of elder care? And to acknowledge that as the planet gets older, there's really no choice. I mean, I think this is going to happen to us, yeah, and men are going to have to do it. The question is, do we do it, you know, kicking and screaming, or do we find ways that we convince men that it's kind of good for all of us? Um,